One of the pillars of contemporary philosophy of language and semiotics is that the relationship between the sign and the thing signified is arbitrary, to quote the famous French linguist Ferdinand de Saussure. That's just a complicated way of saying that when I want to refer to the concept of, I don't know, dog, I can use any signal or symbol that I want as long as it's comprehensible to me and comprehensible to the person I'm talking to, interacting with. So I could write or say dog or chien or kelev or uk, and all of these are basically equal in terms of representing the concept dog. The relationship is just linguistic convention, and no language or symbol set does that any better or any worse than any other at capturing just that relationship. Now, that relationship of sign and signifier in the pre-modern period is much more contentious. Indeed, many of the philosophical, religious, and spiritual thinkers of the ancient and medieval world just assume the opposite of what we assume now. For them, there is a strong, inherent ontological metaphysical link between the symbolic order and the larger physical and metaphysical dimensions of reality. From the language of religious ritual to magical incantation, even the use of taboo replacement in language itself. One may even say that there is a strong adamantine connection between semiotics, the study of how we represent reality, with ontology, the study of reality itself, for virtually every esoteric, mystical, occult, in some sense even religious thinkers, there is a strong metaphysical link between language, symbols, and reality. And I've made lots of episodes, lots of videos exploring just that connection between the world of esoteric and mystical symbols of language, symbols, and communication, ranging from the angelic speech of the so-called Enochian language to the signs and seals of supernatural beings, the complex and sometimes odd symbols that populate occult tomes, and on and on. But in this episode, I want to turn to the ignota lingua, or the lingua ignota, the unknown language, along with its literae ignotae, the unknown letters, of the famed medieval mystic Hildegard of Bingham, one of the most extraordinary women in Western history, from, to my opinion. Now, aside from her duties as abbess, which were extraordinary at that time, she was also a physician, a scientist, a composer, a mystic visionary, and the creator-revealer of a mystical language taught at that time only to the sisters in her community. Let's explore this curious lingua ignota and the script that it was written in. If you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah, or the history of the occult and its symbolism, make sure to subscribe here to Esoterica and check out my other content on topics in, well, esotericism. Also, if you want to support this work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on these kinds of topics and esotericism here on YouTube, and again, for free, I'd hope you consider supporting my work over at my Patreon with a one-time donation, maybe with PayPal, with the super thanks that you can see just below the video, or by picking up some of our cool, like, black metal style merch over on the store tab of the channel. But now, to Hildegard of Bingen and her mystical unknown language. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. Hildegard was born to an aristocratic family around 1098. She was offered by her family as a gift to God, a not uncommon fate in well-to-do families with too many daughters, and she was enclosed as a young child with the hermit Jutta. At this time, Hildegard was already experiencing visions as a child, often accompanied by excruciating headaches. That's a theme we see in many mystics, especially women mystics, from Hildegard to Simone Weil in the 20th century, but apparently she kept these mystical visions to herself, for obvious reasons. Upon Jutta's death in 1136, she was elected to lead her convent, which she then moved to a remote area around Rupertsburg, which she would live there until her death on the 17th of September, 1179. In 2012, she was declared to be a doctor of the church, of the Catholic Church, 
sharing this distinction with luminaries like Thomas Aquinas. And during her lifetime, Hildegard proved to be a deft politician, a profound mystical visionary, producing three substantial volumes of visions, a rhetorically powerful preacher, a prolific letter writer, a careful scientist and doctor, along with an innovator in musical composition, and the bringer forth, as she puts it, of the strange language that's the topic of this episode today. Needless to say, she was one of the most brilliant and talented women of the Middle Ages, maybe just in Western history, and it's exciting to be able to cover her, and I'm looking forward to several episodes on Hildegard of Bingen. Along with the massive output of musical, medical, and visionary works, Hildegard also managed to find some time to produce a mystical language. This glossary is actually about 1,006 glossed or translated words. It's about 1,012 if you count the repeats and the unglossed words, along with a hymn partially composed in this unknown language. This glossary is subdivided along different classes of entities from divine creatures all the way down to different kinds of sinners. It can be found in the main manuscript containing her non-medical and scientific text called the Reason Codex or the Giant Codex because it's a massive chain book now located in the Hessian State Library. Of course, it's going to be a massive chain book, perfectly deserving for Hildegard. Now, this kind of glossary isn't terribly unusual in the Middle Ages. Lists of Latin terms and their vernacular equivalents called sumaria were really popular among people whose Latin was never strong, and Hildegard herself would have never gotten a very strong education in Latin to begin with. Now, what makes this sumaria unusual is that all of those thousand plus words are said to have flowed through a medieval woman from a mystical or divine source and are otherwise unattested in any natural language. The text describes it as lingua ignota per simplicum hominum Hildegarum prolata, or a unknown language brought forth by the simple hum human Hildegard, as if she were simple in any sense of that term. But I do think that term prolata is actually pretty instructive. It seems that Hildegard thinks of the lingua ignota as being somewhere between being discovered or revealed or simply being the invention of Hildegard. She's bringing it forth. Prolata, it allows the reader to wonder about the exact origins of the language itself. Further, there's also some evidence that the Samaria itself may have been the backbone for a much larger project, though some of that is all lost. Rather than just being a list of words, which it can't be a language on itself, languages of course need grammar and syntax and other things, you can't just have a list of words, Hildegard and her secretary Volmar actually did hint that a lot more was going on with this language. The lingua seems to have been taken around eight years to develop, from around 1150 to 1158, which is actually the same time that she was working on her principal scientific works, so there might be a connection there as well. In fact, as early as 1153, she writes to the Pope that, quote, Sed ille qui sine de ficcioni magnus est, modu parvum habitation tetegit, ut illud miraco videret et ignotas literas formaret, as ignotum linguam sonaret, atque ut multi modum set sibi consonatum melodium sonaret. But, she writes, the great one without defect has just touched a lowly dwelling, Hildegard, so that it might see a miracle and might form unknown letters and might utter an unknown language, and that it may by itself sound forth multitudinous harmonious melodies. It's kind of melodic in both the Latin and the English. And in around 1173, Volmar, her secretary, actually writes, Ubi tonc vox inaudite et vox inaudite linguae. Where then will the voice of your unheard music be and the voice of your unknown language? And as we'll see, Hildegard did produce at least one symphonia partly in the lingua ignota, which we'll take a look at in more detail in just a minute. What can we say about the Sumaria or the glossary as we have it? As I just noted, it contains a little over a thousand words, which reflect the needs and concerns of Hildegard primarily as an abbess. The list contains only substantives. There are virtually no abstract nouns. There are basically no adjectives, adverbs, or verbs. So as it stands now, it can't really, strictly speaking, be a language. It's just a list of basically definite nouns. The words themselves are grouped into various kinds of taxonomy, such as spiritual entities, kinship relations, skin diseases. Again, this was being composed during her scientific period. 
church offices, monastic and village life, various kinds of trades and titles, temporal divisions, including times of the year, and words for the natural realm, including trees, plants, and even insects. Again, I think this is connected at some level to our scientific works as well. Effectively, what we have here is a list of about a thousand or so words most central to Hildegard's life world. The words themselves in the lingua seem to have their origins partially in Latin, though to some significant degree also in the medieval German vernacular, met with dramatic transformation, frankly, by Hildegard. Now, to note here, it's not at all clear how to pronounce the words of the lingua ignota for, well, a few reasons. There's some difference in the actual orthography between the two major manuscripts that contain the Sumaria. Also, this is all coming out of a person whose native language is medieval German, and I have no idea how medieval German would have pronounced, and those dialects of German even very wildly at this time, so we aren't always sure of the spelling of how these texts were composed, much less the reflection in pronunciation, so the orthography and the pronunciation may not always agree either. I'm going to reconstruct, I guess, the pronunciations as best as I can, but who knows how they really were meant to be pronounced. So with those caveats in mind, what are some features of the lingua ignota? It seems to have had a preference for words containing the z sound, the z sound, and the l sound, and zia actually may have acted as a kind of grammatical feminine gender marker. Note, for instance, that nazisko is for rooster, whereas nazia is for hen. The presence of that z sound, its structure and an opening syllable with a vowel, gives the language a kind of droning, buzzing sound, a bit like the vernacular music of the time. I kind of think of it sounding like a, I don't know, a hurdy-gurdy or something. Interestingly enough, however, many magical and mystical languages found throughout the Western tradition actually have a preference for that Z sound from the, from the Greek magical papyri all the way into the Zohar and in some sense even in Enochian. Words also end typically in booze tend to indicate trees, such as gramzi booze for chestnut and orchi booze for oak, and the ending skia seems to indicate herbs and other kinds of wildlife, with koriskia for lily and luskia for duck. Like her native German, the lingua ignota seems to have relished in compound words, such as libizamans for book. You can notice the word liber from the Latin for book and the z sound we find all over the lingua ignota. Kirazans libis for missal and Izimzio libis for gospel book. It seems like libis is something like a root for book-like objects. I think my favorite word in the lingua ignota is zinzrins for spiral staircase. Zinzrins, a word seems to be twisting in upon itself. The lingua ignota also just runs a wide swath of words for igons for god to posinzia for for snot. Kilinzons for Pope, Mizia for a flea, and even Dilizans for sword, and Brickzens for beer, Duvulis for devil, and Skrins for exorcist, which is actually the same word for flame in the lingua ignota. But let's take a look at the only actual text composed by Hildegard in the lingua ignota that has survived down to this day. It's actually one of her symphonia, and you can listen to it online if you like. But it reads, O Orxis Ecclesia, Armis Divinis Precinta, et Iazento Ornata, tu es Caldemia, Stigmatum Loifolum et Orb Scientarum, O, O, tu es etiam Crisanta in Alto Sono, et es Corzata Gemma. Here we basically have a Latin text peppered with words from the lingua ignota, although only one of those words, Loifol, actually appears in the Sumaria, and notice here that it has a the Latin ending for some reason. Who knows? The text for this song actually appears twice in the Reason Codex and once with a Latin gloss over the words in the lingua ignota, so we do kind of get some sense of what this means. The fact that none of the other words appear in the Sumaria may indicate that, again, the lingua ignota was actually much larger than it now appears. So how might we translate this symphonia? The wonderful scholar Sarah Higley actually renders it as O oh, immense church girded by divine arms and ornamented in jacinth, thou art the fragrance or fumigation of the wounds of people in the city of knowledge. O oh, oh, thou art the anointed, or thou art the adorned in sounds on high and art a glittering gem. It's positively beautiful. Now, there is a lot going on here. 
For example, the word translated as immense seems to actually have its root in the lingua ignosa's word orshibuth, which is the word for an oak tree. And I'll put a link over in the description if you want to hear the song itself. It's really beautiful. Hildegard's music is rather extraordinary for lots of reasons, especially if your ears are mostly trained for hearing, you know, regular old plain chant. You get these weird scales in Hildegard's music, which are sometimes positively alarming and hauntingly beautiful. Clearly the Sumaria is not exhaustive of the richness imagined by the lingua ignota by Hildegard. It's also worth noting that Hildegard also brought forth a script apparently for writing the lingua ignota. These are the literae ignota, or the unknown letters, and they do represent the standard set of medieval letters, but they occupy a larger textual footprint on the page than the early Gothic script of that time. It's kind of mysterious where Hildegard may have gotten the inspiration for the actual shapes of these letters. They may have come from, again, mystical visions. That seems like the most obvious answer. But everything from Greek minuscule to Tyronean notes to Paleo-Hebrew has been argued. It's not Paleo-Hebrew. It seems to me that it's just as likely that Hildegard came up with it. She was incredibly brilliant, and the script could have flowed from her own mystical visions. Further, I don't really see the literae as having an especially high calligraphic value. They're not especially beautiful, and there's something actually a bit clumsy and disunified about the script, at least to my paleographic eye. To my eye, they look a bit like the myriad Latin abbreviations of that period, but again, if Hildegard said they came in a mystical vision, well, I'd say they, they came in a mystical vision. So why did Hildegard bring forth this language in its accompanying letters? There are a handful of theories, and I want to touch on a few of them. The earliest theory is also actually the stupidest. That it was actually wasn't the work of Hildegard at all. It's not Hildegard's lingua ignota. This project just struck an early generation of scholars as so absolutely weird to their mind that it didn't fit with the otherwise brilliant, prophetic, and scientific works that she had produced. Further, there's actually just a long-standing idea that language in general is linked with maleness, and the invention of a language just seemed out of place for a medieval woman. That's their argument. A woman couldn't have made up a language. Early scholars actually reasoned that it was Volmar. Hildegard's secretary had invented it for some otherwise unknown or arcane reason. Now, this position has been rejected for quite a while now, but it can show even very good scholars can have extremely stupid prejudices, and it can actually cause them to misread and misinterpret the data right in front of them. Hildegard says she brought it forth. Why not just believe her? Oh, right. She's a medieval woman. The second idea is a lingua ignota as a result of glossolalia, or speaking in tongues, or xenoglossia, speaking in languages that are unknown to the speaker, much akin to Hildegard's actual later contemporary Elizabeth of Schonau and today's Pentecostal Christians and many other mystics who speak in languages either unknown to them or other forms of linguistic outburst. After all, Hildegard did experience profound visions recorded in her three major mystical texts. Now, the problem with this theory is that there's no explicit link made between the mystical text and the lingua ignota. And Hildegard does state that she never entered into any kind of trance, unlike some of like the other visions, with the lingua ignota material. So it's not a great link. Further, the lingua ignota doesn't exhibit the kind of phonal patterns such as echoism, where clusters of sounds are repeated over and over and over again, or small phonal segments that are sort of, again, repeated. That's the kind of thing that you typically hear, hear, or from a person engaging in glossolalia. So it just doesn't come across to the ear as glossolalia. Again, it's also fused with a bit of German and Latin. A third theory is that it's just supernatural in origin. In fact, Hildegard herself clearly believed this, and she actually wrote to the Pope saying, and it was said to that one, Hildegard, you have brought forth this language shown to you from above, not following that of a human creation, for it was not given to you in a customary way. He who has the file does not neglect to polish it into a sound fit for men. Now, it's not exactly clear what that last line of this passage is meant to show, but it clearly displays that Hildegard regarded the, the lingua ignota as having supernatural divine origins. So, even writing to the Pope, she said, it didn't come from me, it came from God. So, who are we to doubt her? Other possibilities are that Hildegard brought forth the language to reach back to a pure kind of Adamic pre-fall language, 
which can best be used to worship God directly. This was a pretty big interest of the time, especially later into the Renaissance. Interestingly about this theory is that the list of various sins and sinners, along with the words for things that typically were thought of as inherently bad in the Middle Ages, such as the genitals and, well, poop. Further, why would a pre-fall language actually have so many words for diseases? Those didn't exist until sin happened, and there are over 15 different named diseases in the Sumaria. Another theory actually links the lingua ignota with Hildegard's concept of veriditas, or the greening power, or the ever new vitality of metaphysical existence. This concept abounds in her thinking as a possibility of constant renewal, growth, blossoming, and creativity. It's possible that Hildegard actually brought forth the lingua ignota as an extension of her general creative blossoming from science to prophecy to community and finally to language itself. I find this theory pretty compelling and quite lovely, but I'd also want to nuance it just ever so slightly. Specifically, I'd like to situate the language both as a kind of mystical production, again, without judging whether that mystical origins lie with Hildegard or with the supernatural divine world or both somehow, but again by situating the lingua ignota in the general career of Hildegard at that time. As we noted just a bit ago, Hildegard founded her own convent at the then extremely remote area at Rupertsburg in 1150. Founding the order was extremely difficult, especially given the aristocratic origins of many of the nuns there. They did all that manual labor themselves, and these periods of extreme isolation and adversity I think would create an enormous sense of solidarity to actually make it work. You would need something to give you some kind of core psychological sense of solidarity, and what does that more than a shared secret language? And that idea of a shared secret language, one divinely revealed by Hildegard, is a powerful social connecting tissue. This would also explain the types of words found in the Limber Ignota. It's just literally a list of a thousand words which more or less describe the world around the convent and allow them to communicate and worship in communal acts of linguistic mysticism. The irony of the word mystical here is interesting. It literally means to seal the lips, yet Hildegard's great genius is a mysticism that is not only ineffable, but it quite literally allows for a new kind of speech, much in line with Hildegard's devotion to the concept of veriditas, or metaphysical renewal. Of course, we're never going to know why the lingua ignota was prolata, brought forth, but we are lucky that we're living in an era of plentiful constructed languages, conlangs, from Tolkien to Klingon to Dothraki, that we can allow us to explore the curious lingua ignota both in the Sumaria and in the music that's now nearly a thousand years old. Those conlangs can give us a glimpse into why this language may have been constructed. But if you're interested in the lingua ignota, the absolutely best text is also very expensive. Hooray, academic publishing! Sarah Higley's work on the lingua ignota is a thoughtful and respectful treatment of the theory of language, the cultural and historical situation for the production of the lingua ignota, and a careful treatment and publication of the Samaria itself. Again, it's pretty pricey, you can get it through ILL, but it is the book to read on the lingua ignota. Also, you gotta check out Hildegard's music. You can listen to all of it on YouTube, there's lots of different videos containing her music. It is wonderful in different recordings. You can listen to some of those great flights of sounds as their composition will often just jump several octaves, unlike much of the plain chant of the time. It can be a little jarring, if not beautiful. Hildegard, the John Coltrane of plain chant. If you're curious about her mystical works, you can also pick up the edition of the Scivias in the Classics of Western Spirituality series, though I will warn you the text is pretty difficult to get into. It very much reads like the prophetic literature of the Hebrew Bible, and despite its, I don't know, amazingness, it can be a bit of a slog. Mystical, yes, exciting, not always so much. Penguin also publishes a great selection of her works as well, if you want to pick up a wide range of her things. Both of those books are really affordable, unlike the other academic publishers. The Fiona Maddock biography of Hildegard is also really wonderful to read, and it shows just how much of a powerful visionary leader Hildegard was in a world dominated by extremely powerful men. She really held her own. She was amazing. Lastly, the illuminations of Hildegard of Bingen, which are actually sadly lost, but were 
copied at an early point by Matthew Fox or a collection of those very powerful visual miniatures uh, of medieval little medieval paintings which illustrate her visions and are amazing. Of course, this will not be the only episode on Hildegard of Bingen. In fact, I want to turn back to episodes on her scientific text along with her mystical visions. She even had mystical revelations of exorcism rituals, which can be found in her letters, and she even corresponded at that time with the other great mystic of her generation, the Cistercian co-founder of the Knights Templar, Bernard of Clairvaux, who needs at least a few episodes himself. But more Hildegard content to come. Until then, I'm Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.